Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Hello, everybody. Um, so gastroparesis, uh, we'll start with a quick definition. It is a chronic digestive disorder, best defined as severe nausea, vomiting, bloating, abdominal pain in the setting of objectively delayed gastric emptying without gastric outlet obstruction. But I will tell you this is a syndrome, and not everybody has all of the features, even the objective delayed gastric emptying. The etiology is diabetic, idiopathic, and post-surgical. Most studies show this sort of distribution, more or less. This is ours. And because the topic of this session is uh, complications, we'll, we'll talk about the 13% real quick. Um, post-surgical is undiagnosed pre-op. Vagal nerve injuries possible with uh, distal gastrectomies, hiatal hernias, fundiplications, and of course, obligatory in a gastric pull-up. Also, in partial uh, or minimal gastric resections or B2 anastomoses, those patients tend to get gastroparesis as well. So one thing I, I wanted to point out is that gastroparesis is very common in the GERD population, and it, it can happen, it can be there prior to surgery. So if, it's very important to identify this before uh, you operate on them. Otherwise, you are uh, doomed to think that you had some vagal nerve injury or you did something. And we looked at our patients, about 500 patients, um, several years ago um, in 2009, and you can see the um, orange and yellow bars are the patients who had gastroparesis diagnosed before surgery, before anti-reflux surgery, and the um, other two bars are the straightforward GERD patients. And you can see that the gastroparesis patients just don't do as well with a Nissen. They have a lot of gas bloat, abdominal pain, nausea, uh, diarrhea, hyperflatulence, more so than your regular population. So if you miss the diagnosis, um, you will hurt yourself and hurt the reputation of the fund application. Now this has been borne out with other studies as well, and particularly um, this is a, a nice study showing that not only is gastroparesis cause all these other indigestion symptoms, but it also wreaks havoc on your wrap over the years. Um, there is a higher failure rate in the GERD, in recurrent GERD, in patients who have delayed gastric emptying. So because of that, I believe that that's why this topic was chosen for this session. But the difference in, dif in the etiology, it doesn't really matter. Diabetic, idiopathic, um, post-surgical, the, the status of the of medical therapy right now is that it's all the same. We treat gastroparesis all the same. So it's wise to learn a little bit about it. So we'll try and go through it. First of all, gastroparesis, like I said, is a spectrum. It varies from very mild, um, diet controlled, to severe, inability to maintain nutrition, life-threatening, TPN, hideous, horrible diabetics, or I mean gastroparesis. The treatment is largely dietary management, medication, and surgery. And unfortunately, as, at this point, there's no cure, so we try and use all three modalities to palliate their symptoms as best we can. Dietary management is pretty straightforward, low fat, low fiber, small meals, um, liquid supplementation, multivitamins. Medical management, I'm gonna go through quickly, prokinetics, Re Reglan is the only prokinetic that we have and it's got an FDA black box uh, due to uh, psychiatric uh, complications and potentially irreversible tardative dyskinesia. So we have antiemetics, antacids, pain control we're not going to address, a whole different topic and we'll talk about Botox for a second. But really the mainstay of medical management right now is antiemetics and antacids. Botox, real quick, everyone asks, what about Botox? How about we inject Botox into the pylorus? Well, that has actually been, been there, done that with a, a nice randomized controlled crossover trial. They placed Botox versus um, sham saline injection. They looked at solid emptying, liquid emptying, and symptoms, and no different. So you can try it if you want to. I don't. I don't really worry about it. Surgical management, there are multiple options. And as with everything, we know if there's multiple options, then there's no real superior way. So we'll go through these. Uh, gastric stimulation is an implantable device that uh, emits intermittent, high frequency, and low energy uh, waves. It is usually done as an outpatient. The mainstay of literature um, 
stems from this really well-designed study in 2003. This is a randomized double-blind placebo control study. It doesn't really get much better than this. They put the stimulators in. The first month they were blinded, patients and um, clinicians, to whether it was on or off. Second month they switched it. And then they moved on to the open label. Throughout the study, they did symptom questionnaires and gastric emptying studies at 6 and 12 months. They found that in all patients, um, their symptom scores were significantly improved, as well as patient preference was uh, improved. The phase 2 trial identified uh, this uh, often quoted statistic, 50% of patients will achieve an 80% reduction in vomiting, and 13% will have no effect. Importantly, the gastric stimulator does not, uh, it, it can improve, but it does not reliably normalize gastric emptying. Pylora, if you want to improve, the pylor, improve their emptying, then move on to a pyloroplasty. This can be done in 45 minutes, an hour or two in the operating room with low uh, complication rates. This is based on the idea that there is a decreased compliance and higher tonicity to the pylorus. And this study, I love it, because the middle, sh the, the left is normal, the middle is someone with gastroparesis, and the right is a um, patient who's had a gastric pull-up without a pyloroplasty. And you can see that the gastroparesis is the worst by far. The long-term efficacy and safety of pyloroplasty combined with a stimulator was recently published to do both at once. There were 27 patients, and they had a 60% normalization in their gastric emptying study, 71% improved symptom score, and importantly, no wound or device infections. Uh, interestingly, these were done uh, by laparotomy and six with a robot. So this demonstrated that we could put them in together if you want to. We published uh, many years ago the, our experience with patients who had isolated gastroparesis and we treated them with a pyloroplasty alone with excellent, excellent um, uh, results. 28 patients, three month follow up, 83% symptom improvement, Prokinetic use dramatically decreased, um, and their gastric emptying st studies normalized 71% of the time. There was also, importantly, no increase in diarrhea. People think there will be. There is not. So this study is um, referenced quite a bit, but it's also criticized because it's three-month follow-up. So uh, at this meeting, we, have, we are presenting our 10-year follow-up. And there was 15 of the 28 patients available, 83% um, symptom improvement initially, and 80% seems to be sustained. Now, there are six of those patients that required additional surgery, which doesn't surprise me, and I don't think of it as a failure necessarily, more of a patient selection issue. But either way, um, they are doing well. Their uh, symptom score is 15 at 10 years. The max possible on the cardinal symptom index is 45. The uh, durability or uh, uh, efficacy of pyloroplasty has been shown by others. Uh, Dr. Mancini and, uh, and her colleagues also showed a gastric emptying study improved in 90%, normalized in 60%, and most of their patients had at least some improvement. Also, Dr. Toro, same thing, excellent results, 50 patients. 66% um, of those had, also had concomitant GERD, had a fund application as well. Three months later, 96% improved uh, gastric emptying study and 82% symptom improvement. Uh, Dr. Shada published our experience with 177 patients that had a pyloroplasty for all comers, and 58% uh, of those had concurrent GERD uh, with a fund application similar to the previous study. Um, gastric emptying study improved in 86%, normalized in 77 And there was significant improvement in all symptoms. 11% were refractory um, and were noted to have more severe gastroparesis pre-op. The refractory ones went on to other uh, procedures. The latest popular thing is per oral pyloroplasty. The first human experience was presented out of Hopkins in 2013 on a 27-year-old patient with diabetes. And they, we then followed that up with our own experience of seven patients, 
Four of those had concomitant fundoplications, and they seemed to be good. The symptoms improved uh, or resolved in 86%, and the four-hour gastric emptying studies all improved. One patient didn't do well, didn't do well for, with anything. <laughs> um, one patient had an ulcer that bled. After the initial study, the Hopkins group gathered a bunch of uh, experience from around the world, and they presented 30 patients recently. 30 patients gathered together from five centers, three countries, and also showed that pyloromyotomy, or endoscopic pyloromyotomy was safe and doable and did improve symptoms. However, I must congratulate the Ponsky's group because they decided this looked like a cool idea and in one year blew everybody away. They did 47 patients, three month follow up, they had improved gastric emptying scores, but not normal, normalized. They had improved symptom scores, um, and they had one patient who just didn't do well and had a gastrectomy. Um, they are presenting, I think today or tomorrow, their comparison of a lap pyloroplasty and, um, and uh, per oral pylor pyloromyotomy, which showed that the operation is more difficult for patients with a lap pyloroplasty, longer, as you would imagine, uh, more EBL, et cetera, more morbidity, but their outcomes are about the same. So that's really encouraging for endoscopic therapy. Gastrectomy. I put this up here for gastric bypass because everyone always asks, so why don't you just bypass the patients? And I only can tell you that if any of my patients ever said to me, if I don't eat anything, if I eat nothing, I feel perfectly fine, then maybe I would consider a gastric bypass. But none of them have ever said that. And so you're just leaving a diseased organ inside. We published the, um, uh, our experience with gastrectomy several years ago. And these are patients that are at the end of the road. We have tried by everything else. So it's a very difficult um, population. But we did show significant improvement, nausea, belching, bloating, and pain uh, for most of these patients. However, there was a high complication rate. There's a 9% leak rate and reoperation rate in 17%. Again, this is not your standard gastric bypass group. And we were wondering maybe the first line, maybe first line gastrectomy might be a better option if we can find some predictive factors, which Dr. Shada's paper started to find. Now, Dr. Lippin's group out of USC published their experience on gastrectomy and um, gastric emptying or gastric uh, neurostimulation, and they showed that the gastrectomy was better, 90% self-reported improvement um, overall. But they also had a pretty high morbidity. Interestingly, 20% of their patients ha died over three to 72 months of no, no consequence of the surgery. But again, this shows that this patient population is very difficult. G-tube, one, just one word, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Sometimes I use it for patients who've had a fundoplication and a pyloroplasty because they tend to get a lot of bloating in that first three months and then take it out. And J-tubes... J-tubes are rare, are rarely needed, um, and you need to make sure that their gut is working. They don't have whole gut autonomic dysfunction. Perhaps use a smart fill study or perhaps uh, fractionated serum catecholamines to rule that out. Uh, maybe a J-tube trial. And also at this um, meeting, we will be presenting our experience looking at these particular difficult patients. Like, what's going on with them? Why are they so sick? Um, we looked at them over 10 years that, and found that only 55% of the patients who had a J-tube before surgery um, ever got it out. Pyloroplasty with normalization of their gastric emptying study was associated with removal and so was being married. That was a good prognostic indicator. But interestingly, uh, the etiology, psychiatric diagnosis, substance abuse, et cetera, et cetera, was not associated with failures. We've got a lot of work to do. But in general, what we have come to the conclusion is if anybody gets referred to you for a J-tube for gastroparesis, do a pyloroplasty while you're there. So in conclusion, gastroparesis is a heterogeneous and an interesting, or increasingly common disorder. All therapies focus on palliation and not cure, at least as of yet. Lack of sufficient relief from diet and medications alone is, in, is leading to increased surgical referrals. And the surgeries currently are complementary. More work is needed to define the subgroups to maximize the benefits of each of the different therapies. Thank you very much.